So part of this presentation comes from um, when there was a National Healthcare Decisions Day, which was in April. Um, and then, so part of it is from them and part of it is what I have put together. The chaplains at the hospital are the ones who work on advanced directives with patients most often. So what we want to look at is um, one of the questions to ask yourself is, do you know what healthcare treatments you would or would not want if you could not speak for yourself? And basically, when you do an advanced directive, it is so that someone else can speak for you if you find yourselves in a situation when you can't speak for yourself. Now, there are some cases where people will want someone else to speak for them even now. And that is always an option. The important thing is, do the people you want to make these decisions for you know what your wishes would be? Um, I always try to discourage people from putting someone's name down if they haven't talked to that person yet. Because how is that person going to know? And do they really want to do it? So some of the points about um, advanced care planning, there's, there is value in that. And it's a way to learn to talk about your future health care decisions. And it's a way to understand how to document those decisions using advanced directives, using a pulse. And at the hospital, there's even a document called a core data sheet that helps to um, helps you to understand, give the information if you don't have time to do the whole advanced directive. I, I rearrange the order of these because I think the first important one is thinking about your values. What is important to you? What do you believe about life? What, is, what does life mean for you? Um, what does it mean to be alive? And those are things that only you know. I mean, other people who know you well may know, I think she would want this. I think she might want that. But you are the one who really knows. And this is an opportunity for you to think about your values, think about what's most important to you, and then to talk about those values with someone else. I have two friends as, who are my agents. Brian is first and Lori is second. And so we had to talk about what I believe and what I believe at the end of life, and what I would hope if they had to start making decisions for me. And one of the things I, I remember saying to them was, this is not a clear cut black and white decision. There's always gray areas, so I only expect you to do your best based on the information you have. And, and it was a good conversation to, to have that with them. So they know that I'm not expecting them to be perfect. It is also a chance for you to learn about some treatment options. And, about, and then uh, we're going to talk about how you document your wishes. In the, because we do advanced directives, one of my jobs is to look at all the advanced directives. And one of my favorite ones came across my desk, and I was looking through it. And there is a place, well, there are several places in the advanced directive where you can specifically write something that you want to say. And this one particular woman wrote, as long as I can eat anything, I want to be able to eat Palo Alto uh, uh, Creamery coconut cake. <laughs> now, I love that because that tells me something about her and what's important to her. And we, and we chuckle at it. But you know that those personal things where you can add your own words instead of just checking off the boxes is always really helpful. So why would you plan ahead? One is it could be possible that a time would come when you are not going to be able to speak for yourself. Um, you could be in surgery and something happens in the surgery and a decision has to be made and you are not in a position to speak at that point. Often that might be a sudden illness or accident. I should say some people worry that if they do an advanced directive and they say in, adva in an advanced directive that um, they would want comfort care if they have a serious illness, which is what I say in mine. But if I left today and was in an automobile accident, they're not going to go to that advanced directive right away because there are things they could do for me. So please don't think that the advanced directive assigns you to comfort care only for the rest of your life. That is not true. That only comes into play when you cannot speak for yourself and, and decisions have to be made. Um, 
an advanced directive will leave a guide for others. And um, I think it was in the state of Maryland, they had a campaign and a flashlight was the symbol for their campaign. And it said, um, help guide help guide your relatives or help guide your friends. And it was sort of like, put a light out there for them. Instead of them just coming to a place of darkness and not knowing what, am I, what should I decide for her, you know, give them some light, help them to know what you would want. It will also give them peace of mind. And I can say that because I've been um, in um, conferences with family members or uh, other relatives or friends, and they'll say, we never talked about this. We don't know what she would want. And so if you've had that conversation, it gives peace of mind to those who are trying to be help most helpful to you. And then to have someone else who is able to speak for you when, when you can't. I mentioned reflecting on your values. That's the most important thing, talking to others. And then learning about life-sustaining treatments. And before you leave, um, if you want, there are some copies from the Conversation Project, which is a project that is like a pre-advanced directive. It's not an advanced directive, but it helps people to begin the conversation. And one is how to have the conversation with your loved ones. And one is how to have the conversation with your doctor. So th those would be available for you if you'd like that. Um, and, and then to decide. You know, if I was in some situation where I had a, a life-threatening illness, and what, what would I want? These are some of the same questions to, to be considered. What do you want? What do you not want? What gives your life the most meaning? I doubt that that, that coconut cake gave that woman's life the most meaning, but it told us something about her. Um, who do you want to speak for you? And then also, is there anyone you do not want speaking for you? And there is a place in the Stanford version where you can say, I do not want these people to speak for me. Because what will happen is you designate a person, and then the whole family gets together. And you might have one family member who's not the designated person be really strong and opinionated. And so you can say in your advanced director, I don't want this person to make the decision. And I actually did that for um, my siblings. My siblings and I come at things differently, and I just don't want there to be that fight. And so I said, I don't want. My parents can be involved. If it happens when my parents are still alive, they can be involved in the conversation. But I don't want my siblings to be involved in the decision making. And then, you know, what are things that you want to make sure others know at a time when you can't speak for yourself? It is, um, again, I, I took out a slide today, but, um, or two slides today of this, but. I think the most important thing is to have that conversation. Even if you don't get around to filling out the form, you've had the conversation. And so that means there are people who know what you want. But it is up to you to initiate this. Uh, once in a while, we get a patient in the hospital who has some dementia. And they're not able to sign off on anything. And uh, they, they legally can't sign anything, so they can no longer do an advanced directive. That means no one can do an advanced directive for them. You have to do that for yourself. So um, in some areas, it's called a living will. We, we mostly use the word advanced directive or health care power of attorney. Um, sometimes the person is referred to as the health care power of attorney. Sometimes they're referred to as the health care agent. And when um, people just don't have anyone, and they haven't named anyone, and they don't have relatives, at least at Stanford Hospital, the Ethics Committee has to meet whoever is there, meet the friends, meet the people that are there with them, visiting them, and make a determination. Is one of these a person who can make the best decisions, or do we need to make the decisions? So as I said, you can. Most of the time, this is for only when you cannot speak for yourself. But there are, particularly in some cultures, groups that really want like an eldest son or an eldest daughter to be the one to speak for them. And in one experience I had was a woman who was Hispanic and primarily Spanish speaking. 
She was in the hospital, and her daughter would come when she could, but she couldn't be there all the time. And unfortunately, a young resident had come in and said, um, you know the test we were doing, and we were going to determine if you can have surgery or not. Well, we did the test, and no, you can't have surgery, so sorry, and walked out. <laughs> and the poor woman probably only caught half of the conversation and was crying and was scared, and so they called for a chaplain. And she could speak enough English that I could get this story out of her that this is what had happened, the doctor. And, and she kept saying, why don't they talk to my daughter? Why don't they talk to my daughter? So she created an advanced directive and said, I want you to talk to my daughter and I want you to start now talking to my daughter. And so we put it in the chart that the doctors would contact the daughter instead of her and then the daughter would speak with her. And she was happy. She was happy about that. Who can be your agent? The person has to be over 18. The person can be a family member, a loved one, or a close friend. There is no hierarchy of you must choose in this order. It's someone that you choose. It needs to be someone you trust, someone with whom you have spoken, someone who knows you well, someone who will be your advocate, and someone who will honor your wishes. Now, here's some of the conflicts that can happen. So again, it needs to be someone who will respect your values, whether they're spiritual values, cultural values, or individual values. They do not have to have the same values that you have, but they have to be willing to act on your values. They have to be able to be available when they might be needed. That's why it's always a good thing to have more than one. The first agent, um, a second, and, a, and sometimes a third. They have to be willing to accept the privilege, or, or you can call it a responsibility, but they need to know that um, you have chosen them. And they have to have the personality, the requisite personality, to get the job done. And So here are some of the reasons why they have to have that personality. Over and over again in the hospital, someone has been sick for months. They're very close to dying. And a relative comes from far away. And everybody who's been there for weeks and weeks is, you know, this is it. We need to move to comfort care. We need to say our goodbyes. And then this person comes in and says, what do you mean? We've got to start doing everything we can to make them well. And the, if the agent needs to be able to speak to that person and say, no, that's not what she wishes. And they need to be able to stand up to that person who, who comes in riding on their white horse. Um, be careful of differing values. And, um, and someone, you don't want someone who's, whose personality might be difficult. skip through part of this. Um, a surrogate decision maker is, is verbal. So if you wound up in the hospital, you could verbally tell, verbally tell your a caregiver, I want this person to be my decision maker. And they would put it in the chart. And I think it's like the core data sheet, uh, which is another form at the hospital. And that would be good for about 60 days or that hospitalization. And then as soon as you're discharged, it, they're no longer legally your agent or if 60 days goes by. A conservator is, is someone who's named to make your decisions. If something happens and you really, usually it's, or frequently it can be a brain injury, right? If, and you wouldn't be able to make any decisions, and so they have to name someone f for you. Okay. Lawyers are not needed for an advanced directive. Um, we pretty much recognize um, any advanced directives that come from other states if they have the parts that are in it in the advanced directive. So here are the parts. The first part is naming the power of attorney for health care. The second part is giving your instructions. The third part is whether or not you're open to donating any organs at the time of your death or any tissue. There's a part where you can designate who you want to be your primary care physician. And then you have, 
you sign it, and you must sign it yourself. The exception would be if you are, are able to make the decisions yourself, but say you have two broken arms or you're paralyzed, then you can designate someone to sign for you. All right, so thank you so much, Reverend Scott, for this wonderful presentation. I, um, it's always hard to come up with somebody who's so experienced <laughs> in this area, but I will try to do my best. So I'm a geriatrician uh, by training, and I do a lot of my um, discussions with my patients about goals of care at end of life because I think it's really important to approach that. It's a very sensitive area to talk about because most people don't want to get in that area, and most people are going to live forever. And I start by saying, I'm going to die first. So, and that's the truth. I always you know, look in the room and I say, you know, 100 years from now, probably none of us will be here. And that's the reality. We just have to accept it and um, you know, go on. So um, the discussion, when I'm talking to my patients, I try to make it so that it's really not about the fact that they are sick or ill, because a lot of times, because of the nature of my practice and it's geriatrics, a lot of the people I see are older and sick. But the truth is, as this is a discussion that's very important for everybody. I've made the advance directive myself, for myself, my husband, um, my parents, I push them to make it so that everybody that I love, I know that they have stated their wishes in writing. And um, so it's really an, a very valuable document everybody should have. What I'm going to talk about today is um, how to approach your doctors about the, conversa the conversations and also the key people that you want to get involved. So thank you so much for already segueing into that area because that's something I feel it's very important to talk about. And then um, we have another form called the POLST form. And so we'll talk about it also briefly, what that is, uh, the differences between advanced directive and the POLST form, um, why you may want to have both of them done uh, or you know, one over the other. But the reality is just simply stating your wishes and telling somebody about your wishes that you feel you know, that person really is, could be your um, decision maker is of paramount importance. So no matter in any version you want to do it, in any way, in any language, just do it because I think it's very important. Um, so when we talk about goals of care, um, I always approach it from, you know, there are three elements. You have the belief system that we all have brought up with, the, the values that we care about the most. Um, there is also the health care, the health condition of the person. What, are they super healthy? Uh, what illnesses they have? How do they see themselves if they get sick? How do they wanna, what is an acceptable quality of life for them that beyond that, it's really not worth it for them to go on? Um, what's their value system and how that integrates with their own health? What their belief about, or their understanding of how their value system, their spirituality could affect their health? Because there are many cultures and we live in a society that's very, multi-ethnic, multicultural, and people come in with different belief system, with different values, with different preferences, and we have to be very mindful and considerate and not say the wrong thing. So I always try to tie in all that together when we're approaching goals of care discussion. Um, one of my very friend, uh, close friends and colleagues says, you know, you can't, for example, talk about advanced directive in a Hispanic culture because that's a bad omen, for example. So how we do approach it in a, and put a positive spin on it so that it's not really, you know, stirring any negative feelings. And then the choice of the uh, durable power of attorney is really a key. So I'm so glad you talked about that because I can't emphasize how important it is that you really mind, uh, carefully and mindfully select that person. That plays a huge part in the whole process. So again, we talked about these, the religious, cultural, societal factors that affect our beliefs. The discussion should really focus um, on the healthcare, health status of your health status with your doctor because you want to have an honest conversation. Um, I always say the doctor-patient relationship is a biased relationship in a sense that the doctor knows more about the health of the person than the person themselves. Nevertheless, I also believe that for most parts, when we say, you know, I feel ec in excellent health, actually there is um, a study that, that showed that people's perception of their own health correlates with how well they are doing. So people who say we have excellent health, they are actually doing extremely well. And these people who had lived to, you know, beyond the 
life expectancies that, you know, um, physiologically we believe so. And, and vice versa, people who feel like their health is very crummy and not good also correlate with not doing so well and not living up to the life expectancy that correlates with their age. So knowing your own health is really important and um, having that honest conversation with the doctor. Um, the decision making person, it's an, it has to be an open discussion with all family members on board because again, you don't want that conflict that's gonna happen. And it's all very well meaning people, they come together and the minute they are there and they all have very good intentions, but each is coming from a different angle, from a different belief system. And my brother doesn't want the same thing that my sister wants and not the same thing that I want for my mom. But we all love her, we all care about her deeply, and we all you know, have different opinions about how she should live. But, you know, but she is the one who is the one should make the decisions. Can I take questions at the end? I just wanted to make a comment <laughs> about what you're talking about. And just as you just described in the family, mm -hmm. there's an intra-group variability within the family in terms of beliefs. Absolutely. The same thing exists within the Latino community. Absolutely. There is an intra-group variability. So whereas you think some Hispanic mm -hmm. people may not want to talk, Correct. That's, that's, that's promoting a stereotype. Mm -hmm. It's not true. You're right. There's variability within each cultural group and family. I, I completely agree. But you know, the truth is, I, when I brought the example, I want to highlight a cultural component that's important that I feel, feel you know, as physicians, we should be mindful of people's cultures and belief system and values so that you approach them in a way that you're not going to offend somebody or upset someone when you're trying to build a relationship, build trust, cross bridges. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I, the same thing in my own culture when we talk about, for example, you know, people of Muslim background, you know, Islam. Well, you know, they say, well, most women don't want to have a colonoscopy. That's not the truth, you know. I mean, I'm a physician, I'm a woman, I want to have a colonoscopy. So, yes, the inter group variability does exist, it has to be, again, an honest, upfront conversation, positive and trust work building. So, so with that, um, the decision with the um, discussion with the provider, again, um, I think it's important to highlight the elements that we talk about, which are what are, so the first thing we always talk about is resuscitation. You know, do you want to be resuscitated or you do not want to be resuscitated? Well, you know, what does resuscitation even mean? You know, for most parts, when, you know, you are talking to somebody who has not been in a hospital, they have no idea. So it's important to have the doctor explain what resuscitation means. What are the benefits versus the harm? Um, are there, is there a sickness and serious enough that they should actually pursue or forego a resuscitation? And, um, the, and we'll talk about all these elements. Advantage of artificial nutrition or alternative ways of maintaining hydration and nutrition. All these elements really play a key role at end of life. And what's the meaning of comfort measures? How do you approach um, the discussion about comfort care and goals of care, especially for somebody who's having a terminal illness? Uh, what's, what's hospice? What's, how do you deal with hospice? And what does that mean? Um, I think these are things that are important t terms that are very too familiar to medical people, but not to the to lay individuals. And it's okay to say, you know, I really don't know the meaning of that. Would you please explain it to me? Um, it's very frustrating when you don't know and then the doctor just goes on and on and on in the conversation. Um, I experienced that myself this week when my mom was in the hospital and the doctors assumed that I'm a physician. They were just simply talking on and on and on and discussing all these things. And she gets very frustrated. She's an engineer, very intelligent person, but yet a lot of the language that the doctors are using is not something she's familiar with. It's Latin. So I said to her, why don't you ask them to explain it to you? And actually I would stop them when they are saying something and I say, would you explain it to her? Because it's important that the doctors put it in terms that the person, the patient understands these terms. And Advanced directive and all that is good as long as um, um, the person is not cognitive. If they are cognitive, it is the person's dis choice and right to make the decision. So th that's something you know, I think it's important to keep in mind. Um, we talked about highlighting. So when you talk to the decision maker, again, it's important not to just assign a person, but talk about Talk to that person about your wishes, your goals, your desires, aspirations for your know, end of life care. It's essential. Um, and then 
like you said, the willingness, that person needs to be willing to be the decision maker. I have a patient who doesn't have a family member in the area. Her friend lives nearby, and she put her friend's name in the advanced directive, but she said her friend is not interested in, the, in being that person. And I said, well, how did you, why did you put her name? She's like, well, I don't have anybody else. I said, you got to have an honest conversation with that person. When I'm going to pick up that phone and call that person, it was, the discussion is not going to be pretty, unfortunately. So it has to be, there has to be a willingness on the other side to, be, to take on that role. It's a big responsibility. It's a really big role. And people don't realize that when they are making that decision. That person has to be available. That person needs to take really serious decisions that are going to be a matter of life and death. And that person needs to have the cognitive ability to make that decision. They have to have the willingness. They have to be able to stand up to other family members. It's a very serious position that a person needs to be in. Again, understanding the implications of signing up for the job. We use the same language. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk briefly about the pulse form, because that will highlight a lot of the areas that, we just, that I just mentioned uh, briefly. So what is a pulse? Um, a pulse, it's physician's orders for life-sustaining treatment. And in other states, it's a provider's orders for life-sustaining treatment. And the reason being is in the state of California, it has to be signed by a physician. In other states, it could be signed by other healthcare providers. So it passed into law in 2009, and actually it's been in effect, and a lot of hospitals and facilities have adopted this form as the main um, uh, form for designating uh, goals of care as well as a durable power of attorney. So... This is how it looks like. It's a pink form. It has two sides, but it's legal, actually, even if it's a copy. So a copy of it should be OK. Um, preferably, though, the original form uh, is the one that's been used. And there are several advantages to the false form, and we'll go over them also in, in a second. So all an advanced directive. Um, it's not really intended to replace advanced directive. It's meant to be there to highlight some areas that are more detailed when it comes to end-of-life care. It also is um, essentially, it works best when the person is essentially appointing another agent, um, and that's advanced directive. With the pulse, it's really the person's own wishes stated very clearly in the form. You know, I want this. I don't want that. So it's a bit more detailed. And... Um, Essentially, with advanced directive, um, you have to, I, I think I may have mis said that. You said you don't need to have a lawyer, but um, you, I thought you have to have a lawyer with the advanced directive. You don't have to. No, no, you don't have to. You don't have to. Right. Exactly. Um, if the power of attorney is not a lawyer, though. Correct. No, 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 no. Right. No, but if you, if in order to fill an advanced directive, do you have to have a lawyer? No, you don't have to. Exactly. All right. Um, the the only downside to advanced directive, it's generally, it's people fill it up and put it with their will, with the rest of their stuff in, a, you know, in a case, in a safe, either in the bank or at home. But it's not always. People don't carry it all the time with them. Whereas what we say with the pulse is, it's something that you should be carrying with you wherever you go. It's a form that you actually need to have on you. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes as to why that's the case. Um, it's, with advanced directive, as I say, sometimes it's not completed by all adults. Same thing, to be honest with you, with the pulse. But, you know, that be the case, um, it's not as broad as and specific as the pulse form. Uh, the pulse goes into a bit more details. And um, essentially, when a person has advanced directive, um, the only time the healthcare people can actually execute the wishes of the advanced directive is if the person is in the hospital setting. And it needs to be executed after the, this, the physician had consulted the patient or the family members. So it comes after discussions. Meaning, if somebody shows up in the emergency room and they are in a state of shock and you know, whether they wish or not wish to be resuscitated, if there is no clear indications one way or another, it has to be the physician interpreting the advance directive to decide whether to resuscitate or not to resuscitate. Whereas with the pulse form, it's a transferable. It goes actually from one setting to another. So meaning if a person lives in a nursing home or live in a care home, and on the pulse form, they decide that they don't want to be resuscitated. 
um, they don't want to go to the hospital. If once they designate that on the pulse form, it's actually honored by um, the nursing staff. It should be honored by the paramedics. It should be honored by everybody that comes from the healthcare system in contact with that patient. So that's the advantage of having the pulse form available because it really um, essentially helps all healthcare personnel act on the person's wishes in any setting that they are. It doesn't have to be a physician you know, executing the wishes of the person. So that's really a, one of the biggest advantages, and this is why um, uh, the pulse form has been adopted heavily by the nursing home, assisted living, and community livings, because it's, it really helps the people who are caring right there to make decisions. Um, again, it covers generally topics of immediate need, whereas advanced directive tends to be a bit more broad. Um, and again, advanced directive is not a physician order. It's, a, it's your wishes. It's what you want to have done. Whereas the pulse form, it's a physician order, actually. So at the end of the day, once you sign it, the doctor sign it, it becomes an official order. And um, it is valid until you decide that I don't want it anymore. So we'll, again, go over that. So, Again, the ad advantage of the pulse is it can be completed by the patient and the doctor at any point in time when they come in, in contact with each other. It could actually be even completed over the phone, but the doctor needs to sign it after the patient has signed it. So it can go the other way around. Um, it doesn't require a lawyer. It's a standardized form and very visible is when we have it in a chart. Um, it's basically, as I said, honored by most healthcare provider. Um, and it has to be based on a conversation of goals of care. Um, and generally, um, does, this is more specific, so it clarifies the goals of, uh, or the details of the treatment um, uh, in more um, simpler language, or in more details, not simpler language, but in more details than what the advanced directive does. And we'll go through that again in a second. It's transfer, transferable across settings, so a person who has it can carry it from, the, from their home to their care home, to the hospital, out to the ED, wherever they are, it should be with them. Um, and can be a, a, a simply replaced. So if you decide, I really don't want these choices that I had put you know, six months ago. My health changed and my condition had you know, either improved or deteriorated and oh, my values have changed about what I said earlier and I don't want this anymore. You, know, so you could simply just void it, rip it, cross it and fill a new one and that will supersede the previous one. So it can be replaced at any point in time. Um, so why would we want to fill a pulse form? It really, a pulse form, I see it more of a form for people who have ongoing active medical problems. So I'm not going to fill, for example, a pulse form yet today because my pulse form is going to look so much like my advanced directive. My advanced directive that I had filled already says, in case of an, you know, when I'm incapacitated and I can't make decisions, please do not put me on the life support, you know, for a long period of time. Well, that's how my pulse was going to look like. So I don't want to replicate it, basically. But the pulse is good when somebody has an active illness and they have really a bit more specific wishes about how do I want intravenous fluids, for example? Do I want um, be put on a respirator? Do I want tube feedings? So the pulse goes into more detail. So the, generally I feel it for, you know, for my patients who have an active going, uh, ongoing medical problems that need to be, you know, um, addressed. Whereas advanced directive, all adults should be, ha should have it essentially. Um, time frame, again, it's the advanced directive is really more for future. And by the way, I have handouts for anybody who is interested in that. Um, whereas Pulse is really for current care. So if I'm in the hospital and I'm going to have a knee replacement tomorrow, I want to have a pulse form because the pulse form will go over all the details of how my doctor should take care of me should something happen while I'm in the hospital. Um, it's very detailed again. So it's talking specifically about the current health issues that, are, that I'm dealing with. Um, so who completes the form? Uh, generally with the pulse, it's the healthcare professional along with the patient. It has to be the two together. The advanced directive can be done by the patient themselves only. Um, and um, like I said, um, the, a surrogate decision maker actually can um, 
fill a pulse form on, a beh on behalf of their loved one, whereas an advanced directive cannot be done by a decision maker. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, in portability, as we said, it's um, um, for the advanced directive, once you have an advanced directive, it's your responsibility to have it available to your healthcare doctors, your team. Once a physician fills a pulse form, it's actually the physician's responsibility to hold on to that pulse form as, or a copy of that in your medical records. So anytime you show up in the hospital or so, if it's within the doctor system, the doctor should be able to provide a copy of that. Um, and periodically should be reviewed by both. So we all looked at the pulse form, which is essentially, if you look at the big picture of it, it's divided into four main components. There is the A, B, C, and D. So we're going to go through these components in some details. Um, so cardiopulmonary resuscitation, what does that mean really? I mean, we talk about it. Do you, you know, people you know, want to be resuscitated or don't want to be resuscitated. Well, it essentially involves if the heart stops or the lungs stops, does the person want to have chest compression done to revive the heart, basically? Do they want somebody breathing in their mouth or with a machine to help them breathe so that they are assisted to, in, in staying alive until further interventions are done? So that's what resuscitation means. So, um, and the other one is do not attempt resuscitation or, or allow natural death, the DNR. Why would, why would anybody opt out of resuscitation? Everybody would say, no, of course I want to be resuscitated. Well, the truth is, <laughs> I see somebody shaking their head. Good, you're my kind of person. I would say no either. Well, part of the problem is if you look at, in general, the population at large, um, people who get to the point where, unfortunately, they are having an acute incident where their heart stops or their lung stops, they either have a severe underlying medical problems that resulted in that. And hence, the recovery from that state is actually quite dismal or poor. And they may recover, but with a brain injury or a severe disability or you know, a stroke-like situation. The exceptions to those are people with heart conditions like atrial fibrillation or arrhythmias. They may actually benefit quite a lot from resuscitation. Or somebody who's had pneumonia would actually benefit quite a lot from resuscitation. Um, so it's a good conversation to have with your doctor. It's an honest conversation. I remember very well of one of my patients who had end stage lung disease, and she said, would I benefit from resuscitation? And I told her, with all honesty, um, your situation will be much worse when you go through resuscitation. Because part of it is she had really bad osteoporosis. So that meant if we're going to do all the chest compression to try to revive her lung that's already injured, her bones could easily break. Because when the doctors push, and you've seen these young doctors when they jump on someone's chest, they are muscular, big, and they push with force. And that's actually what the instructions say, push with force. So you see it, the chest, you know. And that by itself for a frail older person could easily break their bones. So recovery from that can be quite painful and comfortable. People's lungs get punctured in that process. Um, you know, they could bleed. It's, it's, so there are many downside implications to resuscitation. So when somebody is at that point in their life, if their heart was to stop or their lungs were to stop, and they are unconscious, it's actually the easiest way to go. It's, it's fast, quick, painless. So I say to people, especially if they have a severe illness, you may not want to choose resuscitation because if something happens quickly and you're going to die after that, it's actually the quickest, easiest way to go. So, you know, so that's hence you know, why it's important to have that kind of conversation with the doctor. And that to me is, again, that's, that highlights the urgency, the immediate issue that needs to be addressed and that, again, is honored by the paramedics, by the nurses. So if somebody checks the box, do not attempt resuscitation, the healthcare providers will not jump on them, their chest to do anything because it's clearly stated as such. Um, whereas in advanced directive, if somebody has advanced directive and even they say, I do not want to be resuscitated or my life is prolonged, if they don't have it designated like this, the paramedics will actually have to resuscitate in the field. They have to transfer to the hospital. Then the doctors in the emergency room will then interpret the advanced directive and decide which way to go. So um, again, this is what we talked about. Um, so the second section, um, medical intervention. So somebody who may or may not have survived a resuscitation, they may not even needed resuscitation, but now they are having some illnesses going on. 
if you look at this section, it's divided into three areas. Um, and maybe this slide, I don't know if it highlights it any better. So you see this third part is, or the fourth part additional orders, which we'll talk about that last. But the, se the, the one to the end before that, so this one, the full treatment, I generally say if somebody's going to choose resuscitation, they want to be resuscitated, say it's my AFib patients, atrial fibrillation, somebody with arrhythmia, who otherwise has a good quality of life, is very active, he jogs, he or she, you know, she swims and they travel and all that. I generally say, sure, check resuscitation. And with that, I would say check full treatment because they would benefit from medical interventions, antibiotics, IV fluid, um, treatment, including being put on a respirator. So if that person, for example, got forbid where they come with pneumonia or, you know, a lung condition that requires them to be on a breathing machine for a short period of time, be it. You know, it's going to be a brief period. Their lungs are otherwise okay. I, I see some people shaking their heads. So, and that's actually, so all these choices are valid. But I'm just, in general, when we fill the form, if somebody checks resuscitation, they, they need to check full treatment. However, if, the, if somebody checks do not resuscitate, they have the option of checking what they call limited additional interventions versus comfort measures. So what are the differences? Well, limited additional interventions, it's actually everything that the full treatment offers. So it includes IV fluids, hydration, nutrition, um, um, even uh, positive airway pressure support, anything that's non-invasive in the lungs. So they are not going to be put on a respirator to help their lungs breathe for them. But everything else short of that is going to be done under the limited interventions. And so somebody comes to the hospital because they had a urinary tract infection and they are really severely dehydrated, you know, but they really don't want to be resuscitated. They've marked that already in their chart, you know, um, but they still are in discomfort and they need to be treated for that urinary tract infection. Well, we're going to treat them under limited interventions. So limited interventions allow for any additional measure that will prolong their life. So all these measures that I've just mentioned, intravenous fluids, antibiotics, the positive airway support that's non-invasive, all that actually is, um, these are measures that would cure an illness and prolong life. When somebody doesn't want their life to be prolonged, somebody has, say, a malignancy or, you know, end-stage dementia, where the their quality of life is at a point where it's really not worth it for them to go on, you know. And if something catastrophic were to happen, that they don't want to be aggressively treated, they don't want anything that would prolong their life long term, they can choose comfort measures only. So with that, um, everything is offered. Pain treatment, oxygen, um, even, you know, uh, sometimes we talk about subcutaneous fluids, you know, or hydration, some form of, you know, sustenance. But the goal is not to prolong their life. We're not really pushing them to live longer. We're really just treating the symptoms that's making them uncomfortable. So we will do everything that's possible to make them comfortable. If you realize that in both areas, it says a transfer to hospital only if comfort cannot be met in the current location. So that's a key thing when somebody's living in an assisted living or a um, skilled nursing. They don't want to go to the hospital for every little problem, for every illness that happens. They would, I mean, the hospital is the last place anybody wants to be in. It's uh, people, comfort is not one of the first thing that comes to the doctor's mind in the hospital. They want to treat, they want to get an IV line, the nurses are rushing, they're, you know, so pain and comfort and gentle care is not going to happen in the hospital. Um, I have to say, though, we, I had a fantastic experience over the last couple of days with my mom. They were the most caring people. But again, the truth is they are about taking care of the patient quickly. So, fa fa you know, fast through place. They want to get the person out. Uh, they want to have the procedure done as soon as possible. So keeping somebody comfortable, they could, they almost kept my mom 12 hours without food because they were planning a procedure, you know. So she was hungry, thirsty, she's had headache because she hasn't had her cup of coffee, and, you know, she was miserable. It's not a comfort place. So people who want comfort, the hospital is the last place to be. But if somebody had a fall, and even they had chosen comfort measures, but now they've fallen and they've fractured their hip, well, boy, they're not going to be treated comfortably at home, you know. 
So if comfort cannot be met at home, they need to be in the hospital. And that's why that statement is clearly stated in both uh, comfort measures only and limited additional interventions. Here people actually can have the option of choosing this one, transfer to hospital only if comfort cannot be met. So they don't have to be terminally ill or dying not to go to the hospital. You know, I have a lot of my patients who live in assisted living and they say, I really don't want to go to the emergency room. I mean, these nurses, they keep pushing me to go, you know, so how am I going to prevent them from doing that? Fill this form and mark this bottom. If you mark this box and you say, I do not want to be transferred unless I'm not uncomfortable, they're not going to force you to go to the hospital, you know, even if you fall and hit your head. So it's important to understand these options because these are options that are made so that they make your life easy and make, you know, make the choices um, simple. And then um, the third section, which is really, this is the tough one. Um, so this one, not everybody understand really how they should fill it up, you know. And, and, and I say it's tough because it talks about artificial nutrition. So if somebody cannot feed themselves, eat or drink by mouth, how should they be maintained, you know, nutritionally wise? Um, we have IV fluids, we have, you know, food by, through the IV line, that's called parenteral nutrition, but these are temporary measures. Um, we can put in tube down the nose, into the throat, and into the stomach, or into the intestine, and these are uncomfortable measures, but they are all done as temporary measures. What, what's really talked about here is a tube feeding. So with the tube feeding is essentially, um, the person who can't eat or drink by mouth, they may opt to have um, a, a tube that's inserted into their stomach from their abdominal wall and essentially be fed regular food through that tube. So the, what are the benefits of that? I say if somebody has a stroke, but otherwise they are really clear and they can't swallow. You know, their stroke is so bad that they can't swallow, but otherwise they are they're having good quality of life, you know, and they want, and they are hungry. This is a good way of feeding them. If somebody has an esophageal cancer or stomach cancer, and they, or not in the stomach in this case, yeah, even the stomach cancer, they could actually put a duodenal tube. So if they have a cancer that obstructs the passage of food from the mouth to the stomach or to the intestine, but otherwise they are coherent and they are alert, they can opt for a PD tube. Does everybody want that? No, for most parts, people don't want to live like this. But these are options, you know. The worst case scenario, which is what we always discourage people from doing, is if somebody is end stage dementia, they are completely gone, they are not cognitively aware or coherent, and then their loved one, they don't want, to stop, they don't want them to starve, so they opt for a tube feeding. The, that's a sad situation, honestly, because what ends up happening is somebody who is completely gone, who is not aware of their surrounding. And we are prolonging their life for God knows how many years, you know, for at least another year or two by simply maintaining them on artificial nutrition. There is very little human interactions there um, because I always say, you know, that nothing replaces if, you, if your loved one is not able to eat by mouth or they have dementia, they're just not aware. It's good to sit with them and try to feed them because that maintains, this, you know, the human piece of it. You know, you're interacting with them even during those meal times. When that component is lost of their day, what's left, you know? So the truth is, um, the American Geriatric Society actually came in with a statement um, strongly discouraging people from going into tube feeds in advanced dementia. Um, you know, as, as I said, we can encourage oral hydration, um, you know, feeding, having a loved one trying to assist the person with nutrition, but not tube feeding. Other situations where it's tricky is neurological disorders where somebody, you know, may have some um, you know, progressive disorder, that's the time when you have to have an honest conversation with the doctor. Again, what are my preferences? What are my goals for my life? How do I see myself living? Do I want to go on like this? Um, is this a quality of life for me? You know, I think it's important to talk about this. Um, I don't know how much, so I'm going to try to grab these. So the options here are, somebody can say, I absolutely don't want any artificial nutrition. You know, don't think about it, you know. And someone may say, well, you know, if it's a short period of time, give me a trial, you know. And, and somebody say, you know, no matter what, I want to live. So, yes, I want to have long-term tube feeding. 
it's important to have these discussions. Um, I, as a physician, have my own biases. I have my own, you know, opinion about what, you know each one of these. But I have to share my views, and I have to respect my patient's views. So if my patient, after me explaining these options, still opt to a choice that I may not be so comfortable with, I'm going to go with their choice because I informed them of their options. After that, they had made a decision that is good for them. And that I'm, it's not my position to impose my belief system on them. Um, so in, in all these forms, so this we talked about it, in all these forms, if you see, there are always place for additional orders. And this is where um, Dr. Reverend Scott was talking about writing the ice cream you know, <laughs> flavor or so, because you could always state what you want. So in this area, for example, where people choose limited interventions or full treatment, I have one of my patients who actually chose resuscitation, chose full treatment, but in the additional order she said, if the doctors determine that my quality of life is poor enough, that the treatment is not going to make my life any better, that I wish to be DNR or do not resuscitate. She said that, and that's beautifully written, because the truth is, if, you, if your quality of life is good, but it may change down the road, that you want to also make that voice heard so that people realize, you know, these are your wishes. And so you can always spell out what you want at the end of that statement. And then there is a section for when you say whether you have or you don't have advanced directive, if there is a legal person who's acting on your behalf, the name of that person, and then your physician sign, you sign, and it becomes official. At the back of it, again, you, you put your name, the healthcare provider who helped you fill that form, put the name, and then any additional contact. So that could be your brother, sister, daughter, son, can, put, can be there. And then this, the rest of it, and this is all the backside of that form, again, talks about all the things that we've talked about. Whether it can be facts, whether it can be transferable, whether it can be, so all these things that we've mentioned, um, um, Who's the, what's the quality of a decision maker? So we've talked about a lot of that. Can, can it be translated? Yes, there are many versions of this form. So it exists in English, Spanish, uh, uh, Mandarin, uh, or Chinese, and there is um, Vietnamese, thank you. Um, we actually, at least we have four different languages here at Stanford um, that it exists in. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But always with these languages, it, the, you need the English version because that's what the doctors can read. So, all right. So, um, in con yes, it sounds important. That's right. Although sometimes you can figure out when you get to one of these forms that are filled in a different language. It's like, is this is section B. Okay, I can tell this is what it is. So, but yes, it has to be. So, um, again, um, I think it's very important that you think about your desires for long-term care. Um, you know your options, you want to know your options, you want to carefully select your decision um, power person, or who, the one who's going to act on your behalf, and um, have an honest conversation with that person. And with that, I conclude my discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. yes, please. Which doctor? And I don't mean that for symptoms. No, it's okay. You have an internist. Yes. But if you're in the hospital for something that serious, is it likely to be your internist? Is it your cardiologist? Well, maybe it's not your heart. So if yeah. you have an accident, mm -hmm. I have a handwritten one mm -hmm. that says exactly what I want. Mm -hmm. It's signed by a doctor. Uh -huh. That was a neighbor of mine who was a doctor here at Stanford. Uh -huh. His wife was a medical researcher here at Stanford. She signed it with it at home. This just this is a copy, and to me, it's just a copy mm -hmm. because the original is home. With it, I have. They live in Southern California now, so I have where they are, their names, the phone number, the address. Does somebody need to know? Who the hell they are? <laughs> yeah. And what kind of what kind of doctor fills out that form? So excellent question. So the question is, what doctor is going to fill the form with you, and should that doctor be available you if they have are reached? And, and you, if you even if you have that doctor, so it needs to be so the form needs to be filled with a doctor that you feel most close with. 
it could be your primary care doctor, which is generally the one that's you know, doing it the most. But it could also be your cardiologist, if that person is, you see that more often than your doctor. Or it could be your, uh, the oncologist, you know, for people who are going, having an ongoing chemo treatment. It has to be someone who is familiar with your current health issues. Um, and I say that as long as your health issues, you know, are evolving. If somebody's healthy and th there's been no changes, for example, in your case, and um, your doctor had filled it up, you know, a while back that they moved to Southern California, but the form, it, you, you still believe everything that's in the form, that's your prerogative and you've, that's your decision and you keep it the way it is. Um, the important piece of it is really that you want what's written in that form. What comes important is um, if you're going to choose a surrogate decision maker, that you want to make sure it's updated periodically, that you want to make sure it's somebody who is current, who's available, who needs to be reached. It's not so much the doctor who filled the form that needs to be reached. It's actually the, the decision maker is the one that needs to be reached. And that person, you have to make sure that they are within a reachable distance, that they are not in France or in but Taiwan. But you said no. your wishes, mm -hmm. then yeah. why would the surrogate Someone because, perfect. Yeah. Because they can speak for you then if you couldn't speak for yourself. But if you have yeah. something written, you've spoken. Yeah. So, so that's a really good question. And part of the complexity of the healthcare system is we have so many options. So remember, this form talks about IV fluids, talks about resuscitation, and talks about nutrition. But say somebody you know, who had filled this form when they are super healthy and they've decided that they want full resuscitation and they want full treatment. And now they, God forbid, they've had a stroke or an accident and they are incapacitated. Well, you know, after a couple of weeks in the intensive care unit and after a while when we've realized that they are not going to recover, do we still want to continue them on the respirator? We may not want to, but, you know, the, the advanced directive still says that. So this is where the decision-making um, person come in play. Because if, if you had not filled that form, the additional intervention, like my patient I told you, she said it clearly in that additional column, if the doctor decides it's futile, the treatment is futile, then do not continue. If you have not put that statement in there, the doctors don't have a choice but to continue until they have the conversation with the decision-making person. But that covers yeah. it. So that covers it, both when they're health, uh, moderately healthy and in for something, and yet but there are always, yeah, so there, there may be a question about surgery. So it's not always a clear cut, and that's the thing with medical system is it's not always a clear cut. So a person wants IV fluids, but do they want to have a hemicolectomy where they have a cancer, you know, in the colon, for example, and do they want to have a colostomy where that's how they're going to, you know, poop through that? I mean, is that a quality of life for some or for not? You know, somebody may not have a choice but to do that, you know, and so, and that's, and they're capable of taking care of it. And so they say, yes, I want, but some may not have the capacity to take care of it and they don't want to go on like this. So there are many questions that may not be so clear. And if the person doesn't have the capacity to make those decisions at that moment, it's difficult to the medical team to act on, I mean, the, we, and we do. Unfortunately, if we can't find a decision making person, and sometimes we believe especially in an emergency situation, that something needs to be done. A two-doctor statement saying that this has to be done, it it's suffice the need, you know. But why do that instead of having someone can speak on your behalf? Can, so. I, just add, can I just add to that, though? On the statement that you have, the form that you have, is it witnessed by two people other than the two people you've chosen? Because... This is a legal document, and to, to make this a legal advance directive a legal document, you have to sign it, and you have to sign it in front of witnesses who are not the people who are going to make decisions for you. And, um, and so, okay, okay. That's good. And they're not going to get any money from you if, yeah. in your will. <laughs> That's part of <laughs> There was a question over there, and I'll. Thank you. Um, a patient you know, in the hospital, you've got information from their wallet who their advance directive points, um, and you call them and they're out of state. Will you take directions from them over the phone when they're out of state? Do they need to come to the bedside of the person? How does that work in yeah. practice? No, so, that's a, so the question is, if somebody uh, has assigned a durable power of attorney and it, the durable power of attorney is out of state, um, can that 
person be contacted or reached by phone? And the answer is yes. They can be reached by phone. You can have a conversation as a healthcare provider with them. And as long as they understand the implications of the treatment and all that, they can make a decision remotely. So we do that often. Uh, there's a question here and then I'll. Yeah, section A of this form is basically black and white. Correct. It, mm -hmm. And there is no space in there for additional orders mm -hmm. on F, on, in A. And yet you were saying that resuscitation sometimes is not good and sometimes it is good. It all depends upon um, the situation. So it seems like I'm, no matter which I choose, I could be in trouble. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a really good point. It, it, it's a really good point, and this is where um, advanced directive becomes more handy. So having advanced directive that says your wishes in more details is actually uh, useful. Truthfully, um, people who fill that form, um, like I said earlier, it needs to be somebody, for most part, who have active ongoing medical problems. And so they ha at that current state, and if you see the slide before that, it pertains to the current state you know, of health. So if the health, is, the health of the person changes, um, they need to revise that form according to the changes that occurs in their health. Um, like I said, choosing to resuscitate is good if somebody is super healthy, they don't have problems with their lungs, and it's maybe an issue of you know, an arrhythmia or so that they just went into, you know, um, their heart stops because of that. So these are individuals who are going to benefit a great deal from resuscitation. But if somebody stroked out and, and they were healthy before that, will they benefit from resuscitation? May or may not. So it's a tricky area. A lot of times we do things to the best of our knowledge. It's not always perfect. Um, you know, but for generally speaking, when somebody is really healthy, I encourage them to do the attempt resuscitation because it gives them a chance of recovery. You know. What I'm thinking is that rather than saying a um, yes or no, mm -hmm. there should be a maybe. <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah. Well, I think most of the time, uh, people who have, like you said, people who have the pulse already have some serious illness mm -hmm. where they are in jeopardy of dying within a short amount of time. And, and this allows them to say, uh, I do want resuscitation or not. But if you're healthy, then you wouldn't necessarily even have a pulse, and if something happened, they would definitely resuscitate you. Yeah. yeah. And we shouldn't even fill this out if you're really. If you're super, yeah, if you're healthy, you could fill it out. It, it's not going to interfere. Um, the main issue is, like you said, I mean, the truth is when you fill it out, it not, doesn't necessarily contradict with your advanced directive. What it says here is that at this current state of mind, this is what I want. You know, and people should always resort to the advanced directive because in there, there is more detail about the decision-making person. There is more detail about what you want in case you are incapacitated. Because a lot of times in the advanced directive, actually, we spell it out where if I'm in a state of incapacitation or so, I do not want my life to be prolonged. Or put that qualification down in I agree with you. It should have been. But the form, when it was created, it was created for people with serious illnesses. So, yeah. So my father has one. And he, he's on dialysis, has been on dialysis for years, has had several strokes. He um, also has had some heart conditions. And so he has chosen to have a pulse. He goes to dialysis three times a week. And he has said, if my heart stops, let me be. So that's kind of the place of the pulse there. Yes, please. If somebody has uh, advanced dementia, what sort of comfort care or hospice treatment would you give to them if they had a urinary or uh, a fracture? Excellent. So the question is if someone has advanced dementia and they end up with an illness that's not related, like urinary tract infection or um, fall and a fracture, how would you provide care for them that's comfort care? Um, it really, again, the care will be centered around managing the symptoms. Um, so if, if the person is comfortable, you know, I, I've had a patient who had a fall who actually fractured. Never had pain, you know, which is amazing. I mean, he looked great. He smiled. He was, you know, the, the, thankfully the fracture was not so bad that it wasn't displaced. Um, he, was, he was at the end of it bedridden for the rest of his life. Uh, and we were managing pain primarily with Tylenol at that point, which was amazing. I mean, I had him on twice a day Tylenol, and that's all he needed. Um, 
with urinary tract infection, again, it, it, it's a tough situation. So if someone has urinary tract infection, if they look uncomfortable, I generally say uh, I would rather treat with antibiotics because it's a short course, it's relatively quick, and it takes care of it. But if someone says, I really don't want any antibiotics, I don't want any interventions, nothing that would prolong their life, it's probably time to think about maybe then initiating morphine, lorazepam, things that will calm their pain, discomfort, give them medications um, that are specific analgesia for the bladder, something like peridium, which is um, yeah. it's a medicine that actually, like Tylenol for the bladder, you know, so that one doesn't feel the discomfort from the urinary tract. And that's completely acceptable. So it all depends on the situation. And the nice thing, if, especially if they are on hospice already, um, hospice nurses generally are fantastic. They are very knowledgeable. They know how to troubleshoot and how to treat symptoms and um, communicate with the doctors. So, yeah, you could utilize them as a resource. Yes, please. Let's assume I have some sort of illness that comes up and I have to go in for surgery, so I sign a pulse. But then I'm taken care of in that surgery. Yes. I go home and I go out and play tennis, et cetera, et cetera. But suddenly there's this record over there in the hospital <laughs> that doesn't apply to me anymore, but it's still in the record. Right. Does it expire? Do I have to take some action to try to get it out of there? Or if I have bureaucracy, that will never happen. <laughs> so the question is, once a person signs a pulse for a specific illness or a, a situation where they are in the hospital for, that pulse will remain there in the hospital, rightfully so, in their electronic medical record, and it's only going to go out if you submit a replacement pulse form for it. Um, so that's when we say really take a close look at that form and make sure you fill it out to the best of your knowledge um, if then the time you know, is there. In general, if you know there is a specific hospital you go to and um, a change in your health happens and you know you've had to fill the form, a pulse form in the past and you've, you know, in that hospital, but you really don't agree with the choices you made then at this moment, you can always fill a new pulse form and submit it to medical records and it gets scanned into the system and it actually supersedes the previous um, pulse form automatically. Um, so that's one way of dealing with it. Um, yes, we, we always talk about it as it's an easy form, it's transferable, you can rip it off and it's the end of the day. In the days of the electronic healthcare system, it's not so <laughs> easy to get rid of. It's going to stay there in your records until you replace it with a new form. Yeah. So if you only have the advanced directive, mm -hmm. you don't have the pulse. Correct. Then in the case suggested, Correct. Mm -hmm. it wouldn't it would be okay that it continued once he's out of the hospital and playing tennis. Correct. And that's the beauty of the advanced directive. It actually talks about your future, what you want um, for, for your health at end of life. So in the advanced directive, you spill out that. Um, for people who live in their own homes in the community who may not necessarily be um, going in and out of the hospital often or not having you know, procedures or what have you, it's okay to have an advanced directive by itself, knowing that the doctors eventually um, will refer to that form in the hospital setting. But in times when somebody is living at home and they are at a state and this is in their own home, but they want to stay there, they don't want to be transferred to the hospital, they really feel strongly about, you know, dying at home or not having anything aggressive done to them. That's okay to fill a pulse form. So I generally, when I look at the pulse form is, you know, I, I'm looking at a document that in the next, you know, year or two, if something is going to happen to me, I, first of all, I ask the question always is, you know, I'm, when I'm filling that form, you know, am I, is my health condition appropriate for the choices that I'm going to be putting in that form? So if I'm having heart failure, if I'm having issues with my lungs or, you know, something that is going to be terminal, it's important to fill the pulse form because you want to have the pulse form there to help your doctors make the decisions that are appropriate for you at that state or the paramedics will act upon it appropriately. So it's really important, uh, especially if somebody feel very strongly about no resuscitation. Because in this form, one can say it and post it on their refrigerator. That's what I tell my patients, post it on your refrigerator. So if somebody were to call the paramedics, say a neighbor found a person on the floor or so, they know what to do. You know, it's right there. Everybody, 
all the paramedics trained to go to the refrigerator to look for it. So, um, you know, it's, it's in, a, in a common place. But in the blink of an eye, things change. The guy who walked out because his neighbors were making noise mm -hmm. yeah. and he shot, and where is he? Mm -hmm. what, what state is he? There's no 100%. So there's, there's, no, no, there's no real way of That's knowing. Just to know. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. So if I happen to be with my mother who has dementia and holds the advanced directive and say she has a heart attack out of the blue, mm -hmm. do I have to call the paramedics? Am I, because, um, Should I call them and tell them not to resuscitate? I mean, why is that ethically <laughs> right thing to do that? It's a great, so this is when it's a really good idea to have that conversation in advance. But say you know your mom, say you know your, your mom's wishes, and there is no advanced directive, there is no false form, then there is no assigned decision person. It all depends on the state you're in. Um, I think even here in the state of California, I used to think that the next of kin is actually automatically can be the surrogate decision making. Me, maybe you correct. It's not true anymore. It actually uh, the the lo the court has to assign a decision maker, a power of attorney. So you are actually by law. I mean, if you have siblings, especially, and they're going to come after you, you by law have to call the paramedics to have them come and take care of your mother. Otherwise. If you have the advanced directive, again, the advanced directive is not interpreted by the person. It has to be interpreted by the physicians in the hospital. So, yeah. I think what would happen, mm -hmm. you can sign a power of attorney in advance. If you, if you, had, if you had a, the conversation with your mother that she did not want Mm -hmm. um, paramedics called, she wanted to be able to die at home, then what would pro most likely, practically speaking, happen if, if she died at home, you would have to then at that point call 911. The police would come, they would talk with you, they would call her doctor, the doctor would say, that's right, I was expecting that she, she was going to die, I, I will sign the death certificate, and then you would call the funeral home. That's practically speaking how it would happen. Yeah, so that's true as long as the doctor has been in the loop and involved. But if you haven't seen the doctor for months, um, it actually has to go to the coroner office. So that's the tricky part is if the doctor can, is involved in the process and the doctor agrees with the fact that this is a terminal case and, you know, the, the death was appropriate and it wasn't intentional, you know, somebody just had an ill feel, you know, about it, um, then it's fine. It's, I, this is where this is a case where really having a pulse form is extremely helpful because even when you're going to call the paramedics if, in case of death, um, the the pulse form will clearly says do not transfer to the hospital, do not resuscitate, you know. And the nice thing about the pulse form is you could fill it with the doctor, with her doctor, yourself. It doesn't have to be her f filling it because with the pulse form, a decision, a surrogate decision making person can actually have the communication with the doctor and sign the form, and it becomes legal. Yeah. Excuse me, um, my husband did have dementia and, and died in, in a care facility, and we had gotten a DNR. I mean, we had talked about a lot before he got dementia, and so we had a DNR, and you certainly don't have to call anybody, yeah. and, he, and it worked out. That's about right. as well as you could. Correct. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. So it used to be there were these do not resuscitate order form that actually before the pulse, and that was completely acceptable, the same thing. You would fill it out, no transfer to the hospital, DNR only. You don't have to have hospice or anything. Right. It's, it's there. Right. Yeah, right. correct. And is that question, uh, did anybody hear that case? Okay. Any other question? There are some handouts, and there are, yes. Could fill out with your doctor a pulse. A decision. Yes. Right. But that might not be that person's, that individual person's wishes. The DNR may be their wishes, and the pulse may not. It may be some well meaning family member. So that's when the, uh, the um, again, the um, uh, advanced directive plays a role. So the, so the person who's filling out the form with the doctor has to be the doable power of attorney. It can't be any random person, you know. It needs to be that specific person who's been designated. Or in general, well, the way we practice is if it's that person who's providing the most care, you know, for that individual, so generally a son or a daughter who's always there will be doing it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sure, pleasure.